Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the North Shore Chicago Professional Development Network. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces that I haven't seen in a little while. Some people I've seen recently as, a, as a recent as yesterday morning. <laughs> uh, and uh, welcome. I'm really excited about today's presentation. I'm glad to see everyone here today. We've got a pretty good group today. We've got about 10 in the room here for everyone that's online, and we're expecting 10 online. Just so everyone knows, we like to keep the line open because we have a smaller group that's not 80 or 100 people online. Um, we will a lot, you know, encourage everyone online to jump in with a question or a comment as you go, but also I'm going to be keeping the chat window open, so if you see me looking down, I'm not doing email. I'm actually watching for, for comments and questions. Um, or maybe. But, <laughs> so, so with, with that said, uh, uh, again, my name is John Kelly. I'll turn it over to my co-convener to introduce our, our guest. Thanks, John. Morning, everyone. And I'm going to introduce our speaker and our topic. Uh, the topic is Carrying into the Future, Boosting Training Transfer Using Predictive Learning Analytics. That's a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, so we have today with us uh, Ken Phillips, who is the uh, CEO of Phillips and Associates and creator and chief architect of Predictive Learning Analytics, which is a learning evaluation methodology. And he has more than 30 years of experience designing uh, learning instruments and assessments, published dozens of uh, instruments as well for learning purposes. And so he speaks often at uh, the Association for Capital Development, for classrooms, uh, corporate learning and development departments. And he's uh, authored a number of articles on topics related to measurement and evalu evaluation of learning. And before he earned his PhD uh, in organization behavior and educational administration from Northwestern, he held various positions at colleges and also uh, team corporations. And he is um, a certified professional in learning and performance. If any of you are familiar with the team, uh, so he was the pioneer uh, testing that out with Eric, and then since continued recertifying like every three years. So he's been certified like five times. Wow. So welcome, Ken, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Diane. You read it just like I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what I'm supposed to do? Good morning. Good morning. Hi, how are you? Well, thank you for um, inviting me here. I've been, uh, I, I knew about the PDM because I've been very active with the Chicago chapter. Um, of ATD, and so uh, I was aware that the PDN existed, and I, and I was on the mailing list, so I would always get, you know, Diane's announcement. And so it, uh, it just so happened that this summer, when I got back from the ATD International Conference, I decided well, I was trying to reach out to Diane and Thank you see if there'd be any interest in this topic with the PDN. And so anyway, long story short, that's how I got here because they had an opening where they in June that they hadn't filled yet. There was a tentative presenter, I guess, but um, they put me in instead. So you're Either you or me. Bruce. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so to get us started, let me ask you a couple of quick questions. First of all, how many of you are familiar with the term predictive analytics? So a few of you, okay. Um, so how many of you that raise your hand work in organizations where predictive analytics is used, not necessarily by the training department, but in other departments? Yeah. What, what kind of organization? Um, HR. <clears throat> HR. HR. Yep. Yeah, well, what, what's the what, what's the organization do? Uh, metrics and analytics, actually. Oh, really? So, yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, we're going to um, hopefully I'm going to share some stuff with you uh, here today that uh, is going to be uh, that you will see or hopefully you'll regard as truly unique um, and uh, also. Uh, perhaps even amazing because what we're going to show you how you can what you can do is to predict the future uh, when it comes to training and development. So that's what we're going to be talking about in here is how we can apply uh, predictive analytics uh, to learning. So that's what we're going to focus on. So the agenda, I've got four things we're going to uh, cover. One is uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the term scrap learning. Uh, some of you might be familiar with that. We'll ask that question when we get to it. Uh, John told me that uh, when we when we first did the announcement about this and put it out that there were some people uh, in the PDN that took the scrap as a verb. <laughs> <laughs> and 
I thought, wow, I have never heard that one before. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a possibility. Uh, but that's not what we mean by extrapolating. We're going to talk about that. The second thing is uh, I've uh, built an algorithm. An algorithm is a mathematical model uh, that we can use to collect data at the end of a learning program uh, and be able to predict which learners are most likely and least likely to apply what they've learned back on the job, which managers of the learners are most likely to do a good job or a poor job of supporting the training that they had sent their employees to attend. Uh, and so that's the, um, the second thing that we're going to focus on here is the algorithm and the, the, the background around the algorithm and, and how we use that to generate uh, predictive data uh, regarding the learners and also managers. And then the third thing is uh, um, we also collect a lot of other data uh, that can be used uh, as part of uh, data-driven decision-making regarding learning and how we can um, use it to uh, uh, measure and manage scrap learning. And so that we have a way to control that or manage it. Uh, and, um, and, and, and then the flip side of scrap learning is training transfers. So if you can manage scrap learning, you can increase training transfers. So that's the, the, the two sides of the same coin. Uh, and then the uh, last thing we'll do is um, <clears throat> uh, I've got a model that I'm going to share with you, and I've been working on this since probably uh, 2015, I think is probably when I started on it. Uh, so it's been around about three years, and I've been mucking around with it for the last three years. Uh, it's uh, gone through a number of revisions and iterations and updates when I collect data and I learn stuff. And so what you're going to see here is uh, the latest and greatest uh, model. And uh, the other thing I'm going to do is we actually have some clients uh, that we've collected data from who use the methodology to measure and manage the scrap learning that they have with particular learning programs. And so I've got some actual data that I'm going to share with you here from a client uh, who used, uh, who, who's actually in the process of using the methodology to uh, measure and manage scrap learning. So I'll show you the actual data that we generated for the client. Uh, and Jack, who's up here at the front, you may have met him. Uh, Jack works with me, and he's the, uh, he's the data analyst guru. So uh, I just, uh, I just uh, collect it all, and I get pass it on to Jack, and I say, Jack, do your thing. And so all the data charts you're going to see in here are uh, compliments of Jack. Uh, you're so, the man behind the curtain. He's the man <laughs> <laughs> So how many of you are familiar with the term scrap learning? So we've got a few of you. Yeah? Okay. Um, yeah, so scrap learning is a term uh, that was uh, developed by a company called Knowledge Advisors. Does that name ring a bell for yeah. any of you? Yeah. Knowledge Advisors were the folks that created the uh, software platform called Metrics That Matter uh, that a lot of organizations use to uh, automate their measurement and evaluation uh, process for uh, the learning. And so they were the ones that, that actually came up with the term scrap learning. So um, the, the definition is that it, is, it describes the gap uh, or the, the gap or the difference between learning that's delivered and learning that's applied back on the job. So it's that gap or difference between what gets what gets delivered and what gets applied. And the analogy that I like to use with the, to help understand scrap learning is that it's like the three ton elephant in the room. Uh, whenever we have a conversation with a business executive uh, around a training initiative, because we as learning and development people know regardless of how well we design a training program and how well it gets delivered, we know that there's a certain percentage of people or content that's never going to end up getting applied back on the job. But the business executives that we're talking to also likely know the same thing because they've sent people to training before. They've been to training before. They know that when they went back, they didn't apply everything that they learned. Um, and so it's like the three-ton elephant that's in the room whenever we have these conversations with business executives that nobody ever talks about. And the reason that we don't talk about it, uh, at least in the past until now, is because we've never had a way 
to measure and manage it. So we, we could bring it up, we could talk about it, but we, we didn't have any way to, to you know, mitigate it or eliminate it. And so it wasn't in our best interest to bring that up to the business executive and start thinking, well, I'm spending all this money or taking people off the job and we're wasting all this time. Um, and so that's not in your best interest right. career-wise. Uh, and so uh, now we can, with this methodology, you now have a way that you can bring this up in those conversations. But it's there, they know it's there, you know it's there, and now we can talk about it because you can offer a way to measure and manage it. So how big is the problem? Um, it's a big problem, small problem? So I have a poll for you here. So in the average organization, what percent of learning that's delivered do you think ends up as scrap? So we'll go through and say, how many think A, 25%? And everyone online, just put your answer in on the chat window. Okay, how many think B, 45%? Couple of votes for that, okay. How many think C, 65%? Okay, more people for that. Uh, and how about D, 85%? I'll bring up the rear. William? <laughs> a lot of people online saying D. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. D, okay, okay. Well, this is the kind of multiple choice test question that you always wish you would have gotten in school <laughs> because if you chose B, C, or D, <laughs> you got the correct answer. <laughs> Depends on the teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so it would be uh, any one of those three. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about this. So I've got two benchmark research studies <clears throat> that I want to share with you that uh, took a look at uh, scrap learning, and this will give you the background where those figures came from that I had up there that were from the poll. And so the first benchmark research study was uh, done by, again, knowledge advisors. Um, and so they went into the back end of their metrics that matter system. Uh, and so they had tens of thousands of data points that they had collected from customers or clients that were using their software package to measure and evaluate the training that they were delivering, these organizations were. So metrics that matter, uh, or knowledge advisors, went into the back end, took a look at all that data, and based on their analysis of what they, uh, what they were able to look at, or what they looked at, they found that in the average organization, 45% of all learning or training that's delivered is never applied back on the job. So nearly half uh, doesn't get applied back on the job. Knowledge advisors uh, are the optimists. Because there was another study, uh, actually Brinkerhoff has two of them. He has one in 2004, another one in 2008, and they, the, the statistics were pretty, pretty similar. Uh, but Robert Brinkerhoff, uh, you familiar with him? You know the name? He uh, was a professor at Western Michigan University, <coughs> taught a, in a graduate program in human resource development there. Uh, he was also the creator of the success case method of evaluating learning programs. So uh, he's, been, he's uh, since retired, but he's still around and still doing stuff. Uh, but in 2004, so 10 years before uh, Knowledge Advisors did their back-end research, uh, he found that uh, looking at these organizations that had implemented training programs, that what would happen is that you can expect that roughly uh, slightly more than 15% of the learners that have come to the program are gonna go back and apply what they learned almost regardless of what we do or don't do with them. So it's like they're committed, they're motivated, they're gonna go back and make it work. Mm -hmm. you know, and it's about slightly more than 15%. We also found that slightly less than 15, or slightly less than 20% are going to come to your training programs, drink your coffee, eat your donuts, and go back and do absolutely nothing. They have no intent or intention of going back and applying anything that they learned. And then he found the middle group of 65% who will, after the learning program, go back and make a um, you know an honest effort and trying to apply what was learned, uh, but when you look out it and when you look at what happens over the course of about 30 days, uh, what he found was in 30 days or less, uh, what's likely to happen is 65% of the learners, even though they're going to go back and try and they go back and try stuff out, are going to end up reverting back to their old ways. So if you add the slightly less than 
with the 65%, um, Brinkerhoff would suggest that there's somewhere between 80 and 85% of your learners, people that come to your training programs, uh, are not gonna end up applying what they've learned. Uh, the 30 days was the, are, are all of you familiar with the Ebbinghaus uh, forgetting curve? Mm -hmm. uh, Herman Ebbinghaus is, uh, is either Austrian or, or German, one or the other. I can't remember which one. But anyway, he did a lot of research back a number of years ago on what happens after people learn new things and how long they remember them. Uh, and what he found was that after about 30 days is where the forgetting curve flattens out. Now, you're not back to zero. You know, you're not back to like you forgot everything. But where it starts to flatten out, uh, so you mem remember somewhere around, you know, 10, 15 percent of all the stuff you uh, learn that um, uh, 30 days is where it flattens out. So that's why the the, uh, the 30 day stuff was in there because there's some science behind why we wait 30 days to see uh, whether or not people are, you know, are actually gonna end up applying what they learned. Because some of these people are in here are, you know, they're trying it, they're trying to make it work, and but at the end of 30 days or less, they end up reverting back to their old ways. Okay, so if we take those numbers, from those, those are two just general benchmark uh, research studies around scrap learning. And we can drill down a little bit and we can apply this to a specific organization. Um, and so what I did is I went to the ATD uh, State of the Industry Report and they do an annual State of the Industry Report, collect data from hundreds of organizations. Uh, and then they publish the uh, State of the Industry Report. So if you're interested in benchmark information about what's going on out there in the broader world, uh, regarding uh, learning and development, uh, this research report would be a good source for you. It's got lots of stuff in it. I just picked two data points. So one thing I looked at was the um, average per employee training expenditure based on the, all the organizations that participated in the research. And the second thing I looked at was the average number of training hours consumed per employee. So this is, this is on an organization uh, level, okay, organizational level. So what it, what they found in 2017 was the average per employee training expenditure was $1,273. So if you're looking for benchmark information, there's some benchmark. Uh, and that the average number of training hours consumed per employee in these organizations that participated in the, uh, uh, in the research, uh, in the industry uh, study was 34.1. So you take those two numbers, and then we can apply the uh, knowledge advisors, right? Scrap learning percentage. And so we can see out of the 1273, $573 out of that 1273 is wasted money. That's money that was spent on training and development that is never gonna get applied back on the job. Okay. The number of hours, 34.1 hours times 15, or I mean times 45, oops gives you 15 hours, so again, uh, roughly half of the time, wasted time. They might as well have not even been in the room or online or where, however you were delivering the training, they, it was just wasted time. And then if you really wanna feel bad, we can use the Brinkerhoff research. Um, and so if you take the 80, I, and I used 80%, that's more conservative, because it was somewhere between 80 and 85, so I didn't wanna make it too dis uh, discouraging. Um, so if we take the 80% times 1273, we see $1,018 out of the 1273. Wasted money. Might as well not even have spent it. And out of the 34.1 hours, 27 out of the 34.1 hours, wasted time. People are not going to go back and use it. So those are pretty discouraging uh, kinds of numbers. And yeah. so I think, yeah. yeah, we have a problem. So that's what, that's kind of some background around where I started, what started my thinking around. So what can we do about this? Because traditional measurement and evaluation doesn't give us any tools to deal with this. And so that's where, where I started thinking about predictive analytics and looking at that and how can we apply that plus data-driven decision-making in order to give us a way or a methodology that we can measure and manage scrap learning and ultimately it then increased training transfer. But, so in other words, Ken is going to point us to what's going wrong or what's yes. going right. 
Yeah, yeah, in both cases. Got it. Yeah, yeah. All right. And you will see lots of data. So yeah, yeah. Lots of stuff that you can look at and say, oh, yeah. yeah. Now I really have a better idea yeah. of what we need to hold. And I'm yeah. sure it's a collection of things. It is. Yeah. All right, good. Uh, in your handout, uh, back on pages five and six, uh, I've actually uh, also created a formula or developed a formula. So if you have a particular training program, that you're responsible for in your organization, uh, you can use that formula that's on pages five and six to actually uh, come up with an estimate of scrap learning associated with that particular program. You just need to fill in the variables, uh, fill in the numbers, um, and then crunch the data, and you will be able to come up with an estimate of scrap learning for a particular program. So we started big picture, with the research studies, we looked at the individual organization, and now we can even carry it down to the individual program level uh, using this uh, formula to, to uh, do an estimate of scrap learning. Okay, so the solution is predictive learning analytics, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we're here about. Uh, so just a definition of uh, predictive learning analytics. Uh, it's a methodology for peering into the future uh, at the conclusion of a learning program and using both predictive analytics and data-driven decision-making uh, to, uh, to maximize training transfer. That, that's what this thing is all about. Uh, the, the mission of the, um, of the methodology is to provide L&D folks, folks like us, um, with a systematic, credible, and repeatable process for maximizing the value of learning and development investments. So because we've got, they're spending all this money, people are taking all this time away from work, and if we can't come up with some way to maximize that, uh, we are uh, we are in jeopardy. Sure. You know, again, uh, the business executives know that scrap learning exists, and if they ever know those, mm -hmm. ever saw those numbers, um, they would have lots of penetrating questions for you. So. Yeah. Uh, so maximizing the value of learning development investments, measuring and managing the amount of scrap learning associated with those investments. So that's what this is all about. Uh, so how is predictive learning analytics different from traditional measurement and evaluation? A couple different ways. One is with predictive learning analytics, we're really, uh, our, our target audience are really uh, individual learners and individual managers who are sending uh, employees to training. And in traditional measurement and evaluation, the focus is on programs or cohorts. We're looking at either evaluating programs or maybe groups of people. We've got different departments who are sending people to the same program. So we might be looking at you know, how this department does versus this department, but it's, it's cohorts of groups or groups of people uh, or programs as opposed to unique individuals. And that's what we're focusing on. The other thing that's different is we're, with predictive learning analytics, uh, predicting the future likelihood of certain behaviors and actions. So we're, we're forward thinking, forward looking, we're trying to predict what's likely to happen based on data that we've collected about the learners who have attended our training program. Whereas traditional learning measurement and evaluation is backward looking. It describes what's happened. So it says, yeah, that's kind of interesting stuff. Program didn't work. Now where are we? <laughs> So maybe you have some ideas, you know, yeah, about what yeah. you might do. But but with the predictive learning analytics, we're trying to get ahead of the curve. We're saying we know these things are likely to get in the way, and so what we need to do is start trying to mitigate or eliminate these things. So as right. more people come through the program, that those things aren't going to get in the way, and we can maximize training transfer. Like placing a better bet. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So this is the model that. Uh, that I've come up with, the third or fourth version of it. Uh, so you can see what I've done is I've broken the, the methodology down into three phases. Uh, so phase number one on the top consists of those four steps, and it's all about data collection and analysis. That's all about collecting the data uh, that we can use then to make our predictions, come up with the data-driven decision-making, uh, and then be able to use all that information uh, when we get to phase two, means we've identified all the data and analyzed it in phase one. And so in phase two, we're now going to take all that data 
and say, well, okay, here's what we know about this particular training program and what's happening and what's not happening. So now that gives us a focus for what we need to hone in on in order to try to, uh, in order to uh, move um, scrap learning down and increase and move training transfer up. Uh, and then the last phase, which uh, has two steps in it, is just you know reporting out your results to um, the executives. So you, when you, if you brought this, if, if you brought up the three-ton elephant in the room when you were having a discussion, you better be able to come back and show what you've done. And so that's what the phase three is all about. Okay, so we're going to walk our way through here, and we'll take a look at each one of the steps and talk a little bit about it. Um, and, and then when we get uh, here to the third step, you'll start seeing some actual real life data from uh, a client that you've worked with in, in all checks, data charts. <laughs> uh, so phase one, step one, we need to select a learning program. Uh, and so some rough, uh, or some guidelines on choosing a program, got three of them, one is, uh, you ought to select a program. If you're going to use the methodology, you want to focus in on programs that are planned learning initiatives, not informal learning events. So something that was scheduled, planned, um, you know, that you, as opposed to, why don't you go read this article or, you know, go to this website and poke around or something like that. So it's a, a planned learning initiative, a planned learning initiative. Also pick a program that's got a high profile. Now, by high profile, I mean uh, by high profile, I mean either it's a costly program, like leadership development programs tend to be very costly. Um, lots of, you know, you might have not only uh, training, but then you might have an executive coach. You might use 360 degree feedback. There might be all different kinds of different components. All those things cost money, and so if it's a if it's a program that has high costs associated with it, executives are keenly interested in knowing whether or not that thing is delivering any value. And so this gives you a way to measure and manage all that and to show them what you're doing to make sure that the, there's maximum value coming from that training program. So something that's got a high profile. Plus, uh, assuming you come back with some really good results after you've applied the methodology, uh, you want it to be around a program that people are interested in. You know, you might come back with great results and if it's not anything that anybody's interested in, um, then they'll say, well, that's interesting, but that's, that's as far as it will go. So you want to pick something that people are really going to be interested in. So either high cost uh, or it's strategically important. So if you've got a training program that's really targeted at some kind of, uh, you know, organizational goal or strategic initiative, again, those are programs that lots of people are going to be interested in, lots of executives, if they want to know whether or not this thing is working because it's directly targeted at, you know, an organizational goal or a strategic mission. <clears throat> and then the third uh, guideline is you want to pick a program where there's going to be a fairly large number of people who are going to attend. Uh, ideally, and we have some exceptions to this, but ideally um, we would like uh, and recommend that you have a program where the, the, uh, you're going to collect data from the initial group of what we call calibration cohort people. Those are the ones we're gonna collect all the data from. And we would like to have somewhere between, and recommend that you would have somewhere between 40 and 60 learners. Okay, now it'll work, it works with smaller numbers. It, 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 the, 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 the data gets a little less um, valid because we've got smaller numbers that we're dealing with, so obviously larger numbers, more data points, uh, better data, uh, and so that's that's one reason we're trying to, now the 40 or 60 don't all need to go through the program at the same time, I mean that can be spaced out. We can do 10 here, 12 here. In fact, all the clients that we've worked with have done that. It's, it's taken them several months to accumulate uh, the 40 to 60 uh, 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 learners. Is that what you were That was my question, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you don't have to all ask. Yeah, like, that's a really big group. Uh, that's that's group. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, they don't all need to go through at one time. That's a large group. Yeah. yeah. And so does all of this have to be done up front, like prior to the start of the learning program, because you're collecting the data ahead of time or during or after? Um, ideally, but it doesn't have to. You can take a program that's been implemented, you know, that you've been putting out there, but you've never used this methodology to okay. assess scrap level. We're going to start here, you know, this date. So everybody going through the program from this point on, boom, 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 boom. 
until we get to 40 or 60 or 50 or whatever it is. They're going to be our calibration cohort, and we're going to we're going to use them. They're kind of like the guinea pigs, the people we collect all the data from. Now they benefit from all the stuff you're going to create as well. They they just don't. They're they're going to get it. They'll be more spaced out. Whereas people who come after them, uh, you'll have all this stuff in place, and you'll just roll it out yeah. just as you know part of the part of the training design. Mm -hmm. Okay, we okay on selecting a program? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So pick something that you know, if people are interested in this. Got some large numbers. Okay, so phase one, step two. Uh, build a PLA algorithm and create a survey. Now I've done all the heavy lifting here for you on the algorithm. So this is the algorithm is based on um, lots of research uh, around looking at training transfer. Uh, and we're going to go through some of that just to give you a background so you can see that this is all the, the algorithm is all research driven. Uh, so there's research behind the, the, the components that we're going to talk about in terms of training transfer, research behind all the uh, uh, input variables that are part of those uh, components. Uh, and so there's, uh, it's all scientifically you know, based. So. So I've done all the heavy lifting, so basically what you need to do is to take the, as you'll see here in a second, take the uh, input, or take the uh, the, the, uh, in, uh, the variables um, for the algorithm and just convert them into survey items, which I'm going to show you how to do. Okay, so the research, we can see down at the bottom, are three research studies that have been done that have found, uh, they all found the same stuff. The training transfer is really a function of three main components. Uh, and one of them is the learning program design. That's probably not a big surprise. Uh, a second one are learner attributes. Those are things about the learners themselves, how motivated they are, you know, things of that nature. Uh, and then the third component is the learner work environment. Those three things all intersect um, and uh, are going to determine whether or not, or not whether or not, but how much training transfer you're going to get. So, so the extent to which you can align those circles, get them on top of one another, that increases your uh, chances of maximizing training transfer. Now, when we look at these three components, um, you know, as learning and development people, we have direct control over the learning program design. That's something that we control, right? Uh, that's in our bailiwick because we're designing the training program. But that doesn't mean we don't have any any influence on the other two, because obviously, you know, people, some people are going to be learners, are going to be motivated, others aren't, and so on. But we can influence that. So while we don't have the direct control, like with the learning program design, we do have influence over this in terms of messaging that goes out to our learners before the training, about why they're going, why they're coming to this training, and lots of different things that we can do to influence uh, learner attributes in terms of of their attitude towards the training. Yeah. Uh, and then the same way with the learner work environment. We don't have control over that, but again, there are things that we can do to influence that uh, to increase the likelihood that we're going to have the right <coughs> work environment, the learners are going to go back to the right work environment uh, so that it will maximize or increase the likelihood of maximizing uh, training transfer. And as I said, when we have all those circles aligned, that's when uh, we are going to increase the likelihood that we're going to maximize training transfer. Now, the algorithm is built off those three uh, components. So again, also research driven, just as the components were. So the 12 factors or input variables uh, that are the uh, part of the, the algorithm, um, again, are research driven. And uh, these are all things that where there's research out there that says, yeah, if this happens, this is likely to increase training transfer. So what I'd like to do is just see um, how many of these things you can come up with before I share the 12 with you that I found in research. So what I'd like to do, we won't follow this exactly, so we're gonna do what we talked about, yes? Mm -hmm. All right, so we're gonna break up into three groups. So we'll have the uh, folks on the phone, we'll have this side of the room, be a group and then this side of the room be a group and so what we're going to do is to focus in on the three components and so what I'd like you to do is then given the uh, component that I give you is just spend three minutes 
uh, brainstorming, what kinds of things can you think of that would need to occur uh, in order to increase training transfer around learning program design? Or what kinds of things would need to happen in order to increase training transfer around uh, influencing learner uh, attributes? Or same thing from the work environment. So I'll give you an example. So learning program design, one of the things that was found in research is relevancy. If people don't, if learners don't find a program as relevant to them in their job, uh, there's little likelihood they're going to apply it back on the job. So that's one I'll give you. Uh, learner attributes, those are things about the learners. Um, we know that you know people who are motivated, there's going to be a certain percentage. We talked about the 15, the Brinker off found 15%. There's going to be some learners who are going to be motivated to go back and apply what they've learned almost regardless of what we do or don't do with it. So learner at one learner attribute would be motivation, individual motivation. Again, we can't control that, but we can influence it. And the learner work environment, the example I had on the slide was um, the, uh, um, uh, the immediacy of applying what they've learned. So how long after they get back on the job is it going to, will, they, will it be before they have a chance to apply what they've learned? That's a work environment one. So let's let you guys do the learner attributes. Okay. On the phone can do the learning program design. And this side of the room, you guys can do work environment. So three minutes. Yep, John. And so everyone online, we're uh, gonna do our small group in the chat window. So just go down to the bottom of, or the top of your screen, hit the chat button, and then uh, enter our discussion there. Okay. So three minutes, see what you come up with, and then we'll, I'll, I'll share with you then what I found in, uh, in my research. Okay, so let's start with the program design factors first, and we'll see what, uh, that was the uh, folks that are on the phone. So John, um, what, yeah. kind of, what kind of uh, input variables did you come up with that relate to program design? Well, actually, do you have about half an hour? It was a very lively discussion. There's a lot of carpal tunnel going on out there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Share what the objective of doing something is and have the participants work in small groups to come up with ideas on how they would do it. So I guess in a sense have them to say, here's how you're going to use it back to work, have them actually brainstorm in groups okay. to do that. Um, it, you know, very simply just make the training um, engaging, memorable, entertaining so that people don't check out during okay. the middle of it. Okay. Um, um, uh, make sure it's designed based on learning objectives, uh, real clear, uh, and that it's, those objectives are linked very closely to how they will succeed at their job by using those things. Okay. Um, test comprehension during it. Um, have the manager and attendee meet ahead of time about the content, set expectations for what they expect them to learn. Um, uh, uh, have the superiors go through the program before the, the, okay. the learners do it. Um, vary the learning methodology, audio, visual, kinesthetic, um, and make sure you have a lot of pr practice application exercises during. Okay. I think that covers everything. Hope I didn't leave anyone out. Okay. Well, if they did, they can chime in. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Okay, good. So, uh, let me share with you the ones that I found, because some of those, you, you found, you got some of them. And, I, and I'm not minimizing the other things that you came up with, just that I haven't found any research that says, yes, if you do this, this leads to training transfer. So, the ones I'm going to share with you all have a research base to them. Um, and uh, so, that's not to minimize any of the other suggestions. Uh, they're, they're, you know, a lot of them make sense intuitively. Right. So there's just not necessarily, I haven't found any research to support it. So one of the program design factors is that the learners need to acquire new information. If they don't learn anything new, there's nothing new to apply back on the job. So they have to acquire new information. And there are training programs, as you know, that get people go through stuff they've been through before a <laughs> number of times, and they're not learning anything new. Not when, when, I'll sh when we talk about some of the data, we'll uh, show you an example of that. Learners view the program as relevant to themselves and to their jobs. So I gave you that one. John? Well, it just, yeah, that's a John Kelly. That first one I think is more important than we really realize, because a lot of times we have mandatory training rolled out in corporations and put someone through the exact same training. Yep with just different bells and whistles than they took five years ago. Yep. So, so. 
uh, and compliance training is right. one that oftentimes gets uh, that rap, right? You know, I've been through this before, but somebody did something, and so now everybody has to go through right. the training again. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then that's probably not a good program to choose for staff. <laughs> 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 Okay, so learners view the program as relevant to themselves and their job. That one makes sense, yes. If they don't see it as relevant, not likely to apply it. Learners view the program as an important investment in their own career development. So they see how this thing fits in uh, to their job and to their career. So they, 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 that, some information has been given out to them that explains to the learners, here's how this thing is going to help you in your job and in your career. And then the fourth one, uh, learners are, see a likely improvement in a key department business metric if the new information that they've learned gets applied back on the job. This goes back to, you know, if you are familiar with the ADDIE model, right? We need to do the analysis. Why are we need this training in the first place? If you do that well, that gives you the answer here, which can be conveyed then to the learners so they understand why they're going through this program. There, there, there's some business reasons for it. And it, it, the program and the material in the program is then connected to the business metric um, that was identified as, you know, in need of improvement. So they see the connection there. Okay, so let's do the learner attribute factors. We'll do the same thing. Um, so you guys had that. Yeah. So what were some of the things you came up with? Well, one of them was selection of the trainees, uh, whether they're high potential or they're at risk, if it's safety trainers, something like that, where it, it's something, it, it goes to relevancy. Uh, but, but it's something where you select the right people for that training. It's not something that's irrelevant to them. Right. Um, another thing we came up with was age, just chronological age, and then also length of service, sort of correlated there, where younger people, especially people newer to the organization, are probably going to be a little bit more motivated to do the training, learn new things, than people who are you know, two years from retirement or you know, that sort of thing. Right. Um, and then the last thing we talked about was WIFA. You know, what's in it for me? Or Simon Sinek, start with why. Right. So you understand why it's important. And if they understand why it's important, they're more likely to be successful. OK, good. So let's see what the survey says. Like, what was the um, mm -hmm. family feud? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Survey, right? the survey <laughs> so again, all good, all good, uh, good uh, points. And so now we'll share with you what uh, I found in the research. So we talked about this one. Learners are personally motivated to apply what they want. May get at you know the mm -hmm. newer employees versus the older ones and some of that kind of stuff you were talking about, Eric. Uh, number six, learners are confident. Uh, in their ability to apply what they've learned. Doesn't mean that they necessarily feel like they've mastered everything at the end of a training program, but at least they've gotten to the point, and it goes back to some of the learning program design stuff, John, that you were talking about in terms of, you know, practice and, you know, in, in, and uh, uh, different different um, ways of conveying the information and all those different things that build confidence so that when people leave the training program, that every one of them feels like, okay, I know I can go back and try this out because I, uh, you know, I've got enough confidence to do that. I know I'm probably not going to be very good at it, um, and I'm not going to be an expert at it right away. But I've got enough confidence to go back and try it. So it's building the confidence. Uh, the uh, third one under learner attribute is the learners take time to reflect on the key lessons learned. Mm -hmm. Uh, and how what they've learned will have helped them improve their performance. This was some interesting research that was done recently. Uh, and the, uh, the, what they found in the research was that just the act of asking people to reflect, take a minute or two minutes, you know, you can even build this into learning program design. You know, start, you, know, take, you know, at the end of a module, take three minutes, just think about what we covered and think about how you can apply this information in your job. But it's also then encouraging the learners after the program is over to take a few minutes to think about all the things that were covered um, and, and how they can, how they will help them improve their job. And they found that all the things that we are the things that we sometimes do at the end of learning programs where we have people create action plans and we have them, you know, talk to you know other 
uh, uh, learning colleagues or we have them go back and encourage them to go back and talk to their boss and uh, do all those other things, that those things do not contribute anything more than the act of reflecting. Mm -hmm. There is no significant increase in training transfer and doing all those other kinds of things than, than uh, that went beyond just the act of reflecting really? on it. Really? Yeah. Wow. Surprising. Oh. Okay. It was, uh, it was uh, yeah, if you're interested, I've got the research study. It was uh, the woman from uh, Harvard. Not that that makes any difference. Could have been from Benedictine, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, but she was from Harvard and did all this research. So it, it was relatively new stuff. Diane? So how is that not part of program design versus learner attribute? Like, how do you know who's going to reflect and who isn't? You, you, we we yeah. don't. So we try to influence that. Yeah. We, we can build in, in the training program, we can build in reflection. When they go back on the job, after they've gone through the whole program, then we've only got influence, right? Mm -hmm. So we've got to try to encourage people uh, to when they go back, you know, you might send out reminder emails. I mean, there might be a number of things yeah. you do to get that to happen or to try to increase the likelihood that that's going to happen. But to take some time, it doesn't have to be 20 minutes. It can be three or four minutes. Just take some time. Think about all the things that were covered and how these things might help you improve your performance. Mm -hmm. Ken, Ken okay. what, how, how do you measure someone's personal motivation? Is there a little quiz or do you interview them? How do you, how can you select people and know that in advance? Um, yeah, don't know. You don't. Okay. We try to influence it. Okay. And we can influence. I mean, there are things we can do to influence. So these aren't the selection factors. No. These are, okay. This yeah. isn't about how we no. select. No, people. no, no, not no. We're just taking people and putting them through this training program like we've always done. And we're just using a different way to, All right. uh, you know, evaluate. The, the information, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's what you say in right, okay, I right, all right. I'm but I get wondering, yeah. could you do a, a pre program assessment and design some questions around this to assess readiness for some of these attributes? You know, Good or interest or yeah. real interest, to, like to how understand. bad do you want it? Yeah. yeah, Good, yeah, yeah. Uh, you'll see what you'll see where we're going. Uh, you know, I haven't forgotten it. You'll see um, how we're going to use the data because we're going to collect a lot of data from this stuff, and how we can then really identify those learners that we really need to target uh, in terms of um, you know providing them with support, reinforcement, whatever it might be, to increase the likelihood that they're going to apply what they learned. Okay. So because here we don't know. Right. We're just, you know, some business executive said, hey, everybody needs this. So we said, okay. Yeah. And I guess that's more so where my question is that from a data standpoint, like Tim said, how do you, how do you measure a lot of these? These seem, they're pretty ambiguous, right? They're not, um, you need, you need to determine is someone motivated or not, right, to go into your, your algorithm. And how is that measured? Is it a survey of yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm motivated? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to show you the, we can take the 12, these 12 uh, input variables, mm -hmm. okay, or 12 factors. Uh, we're going to convert each one of them into a survey item, and then we'll collect okay. data around those. So, I mean, we're, we're getting to that. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> They're just an overachiever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the last one is uh, learners view the program as an opportunity to learn challenging new things. This might get back at some of the stuff you were also talking about, Eric, in terms of, you know, older people who've been around a long time versus the newer people, um, although it's not necessarily an age thing. Right. I mean, the research doesn't suggest that it's just limited to age. But there are people, you know, probably like all of us who uh, are what we would call like lifelong learners. I mean, we, we're eager to learn new things. We look forward to that. But there's a whole bunch of other people out there that come through our learning program who don't have that attitude at all and are, you know, afraid of learning new things because they're afraid that if, if I have to apply this stuff, I'm going to look bad. And so there's a whole bunch of research around the way people view uh, training programs. And again, it's not something we can use as a selection tool, but we can be aware of it. Uh, and then we'll, again, when we crunch the numbers, yeah. you will see how we can apply it.
Okay, so let's talk about work environment factors. So we go one last group. What did you come up with? <laughs> All right. Um, well, <laughs> you threw us the bone with the immediacy, immediacy to applying the job. Thank you. So we just wanted to reiterate that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then we talked about the role of, of coaching by the manager. Okay. Uh, Good. After, the, after the learning experience. Good. Which then led to really is there manager buy in from mm -hmm. the beginning, or is this person being sent without my wanting them to? Right. Okay. Um, and then there was a question of whether the manager could support them, whether they had the skills. Sometimes we don't put the leaders through the same things because they don't have the time or it's below them in their mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to applying it back on the job, if the leader doesn't know how to coach them through that, or if they're not a good coach, I think a good coach could still coach them through that. But if they're not a good coach, they're not going to bother. Okay. So then that sends the message to the learner that this is not important. Right. And it's, you know, dusty on the shelf again. Um, we talked about a tolerance for the short-term loss of productivity when you're learning to do something a new way. Yeah. There's a dip. And if it's one of those environments where it's, you know, go, 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 100% all the time, they're not going to tolerate any kind of losses. Okay. They don't give people time to... Right. To, to master what they want. Right, so yeah. you revert. Yeah. Um, the barrier between, uh, there, there could be a barrier when that's set up it, unintentionally between the people who went to training and the people that didn't go to training. So there's sort of a have and have not kind of thing right. happening there. Okay. And then uh, really kind of stemming from the learning program design is the training itself a bad cultural fit. Oh, Did we okay. bring in this great thing from I don't know, pick a pick a company, Covey. Yeah. Uh, and if that doesn't work for the environment of that organizational culture, okay. Yeah. Okay. So some good suggestions. Survey says. Survey says. You got some of them. <laughs> Ken, just to maybe build on what you just said, is I've also seen they bring in the training to change the culture, uh, but do nothing else. To right, change right, the culture. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Good point. So one of the things, again, found in the research that uh, increases the likelihood of training transfer is pre-training uh, discussions between a manager uh, and the, the, the employees that the manager is sending to the training. And I don't mean discussion like, you're, you're, by the way, you're going to training, John, next week. I mean a discussion <laughs> around that. So manager discusses the training program with learners prior to the time that learners are going to attend the program. Managers actively engage the learners post-program regarding what was learned and how the learners are going to apply what they learned back on the job and have a discussion around post-discussion around that. Again, more than just saying, what you think about the training, right? Uh, work colleagues support the learners post-program. Now, if you, you kind of were talking about that, Christopher, yeah, about whether the the, the environment, uh, you were talking about environment, but you also mentioned work colleagues, I right. think, too. Yeah. yeah. So whether the work colleagues support the learners post-program when applying new things, um, or do they tell them, like you were, you were suggesting, Christopher, you know, don't, don't worry about that stuff. You know, just go and do your job the way you've always done it. Right. Yeah. Um, and then the last one, which was the one I gave you, learners have an immediate opportunity to apply what was learned. So those are the 12 input variables that make up the algorithm, the mathematical model uh, that we will use to make our predictions and also uh, identify a number of other data, uh, pieces of data that we can use to measure and manage scrap learning. So let me just talk about uh, the survey. So we're going to take each one of those factors and create a, um, uh, create a survey item. I'll give you some examples of some survey items so you can see what they uh, what they look like, the ones that we use. Uh, and you then take your survey items and you can either incorporate them into, if you've got an existing level one evaluation, uh, you can simply incorporate those 12 survey item questions into an existing level one evaluation, or you can make, make a separate, uh, create a separate survey uh, and then just administer it, um, you know, either at the right after you do the level one or 
the next day after people get back to the job or whatever, if you don't want to co-mingle um, the two. <laughs> Could you clarify what a level one is? There may be some people in the room who don't. Oh, yeah, good point. Everybody know what a level one evaluation is? Yes? Go ahead and explain. Okay. So level one, there's four levels of evaluation. Level one is focusing on participant reaction to a training program um, and capturing data around what people, what the learners thought about the program, what they thought about the materials, what they thought about the instructor, um, and so on and so forth. So it's basically capturing data right after a learning program is over from the learners about their reaction to the training. And so we can just, uh, and whatever questions you have around on your level one, you can just incorporate in. We've had, uh, in the organizations that Jack and I have worked with, we've had some do it one way and some do it the other. Some of them just administered a separate survey. Some of them, uh, one of them uh, took their level one evaluation and trashed it and just used these. And another one uh, ended up combining them where they had, you know, some level one stuff and then they had the uh, question. So it was done different ways and there's no one right way to do it, whatever seems to make sense to you. So here's some sample survey items. So you can see how we took those factors, right? Here's the one on relevancy. So this is from the learning program design. So we created a survey item that said, so how relevant is the, whatever the program was, you know, leadership development, situational leadership, um, new hire orientation, whatever it is, um, how relevant is the blank program uh, to you and your job? And then we had a seven point Likert scale that people would use to provide their responses. And the second one, this was from the uh, learner attributes, uh, the one on confidence. So how confident are you in your ability to apply the knowledge, skills, and behaviors you learned in the program uh, back on the job? And again, a liquid scale. So we took each one of those, each, each one of the 12 and converted it into a survey item like one of these. These? Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so any questions on the algorithm or on the survey? Did it answer your question about the survey? <clears throat> okay. We're okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so let's go on. Phase one, step three. So now we've administered the uh, survey, right? We collected the data. Uh, and so now what we're going to do is uh, analyze the data, Jack is, and, um, and then we're going to come up with some <clears throat> predictions as well as some other uh, data that we can use to uh, measure and manage scrap learning that we'll see how we, uh, how we use it all, all from the same 12 questions. We just crunch the numbers differently, and you'll see that as we go through here. All right, so the case study, I'm, the data I'm going to share with you is from a company uh, that was a medical insurance company. They're down in uh, San Antonio, Texas. And uh, their business objective was, uh, because they process lots of paper, uh, and so they were, their uh, business objective was try to uh, increase operational efficiency, to try to process the paper faster, quicker, more accurately, all those kinds of things. So the learning program that they put people through was one around continuous process improvement. So it was, a, it was a training program they put everybody through on how to uh, use continuous process improvement to increase efficiency, operational efficiency. Calibration cohort, this case, was 74 participants. So they had 74 people who initially went through the program. They were the guinea pigs. They were the ones we collected all the data from. Um, and so the data I'm going to be sharing with you is from those 74. <laughs> so we took the results from the survey from the 74 people. And what we did was then broke the learners um, into three different groups. And the LAI stands for Learner Application Index Score. That's just our own name for it. Um, and so we broke them into three groups. We got the green people who are most likely to apply what they've learned in the training program back on the job based on their, based on the scores from those 12 uh, survey items, okay? We have the yellow people who are at risk of not applying what they've learned. They're the ones from the Brinkerhoff research who are gonna go back and try it out, but ultimately end up reverting back to their old ways. And the green people are the ones from the Brinkerhoff research who are in the top 15% 
that are going to go back and make it work re almost regardless of what we do or don't do with it. And then the red people are the ones who are least likely to apply what they've learned. So we took the scores on the 12 survey items for every, every learner. So these numbers on the left side here, those are all individual learners. Each one of those numbers corresponds to a learner. Jack and I don't know who they are, but the, the insurance company does. So we just crunched the data. And then the numbers and the, and the colored columns to the right are the scores that each one of these learners got. So the learner uh, 3904 uh, had on the 12 uh, survey items had sevens across the board. And over here, learner 43859 had a score of 3.36 on the 12 when we added up and came up with an average and so that was the average score for the, the 12 survey items for that learner Ken, wow i mean i love this and you are magic behind the scenes but <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i i I've, I've been known to be one of those donut eaters all right yeah. i'll be <laughs> damned if i'm ever going to admit to my leadership that's spending money on me that i'm I'm going to write down that I'm, man, with, with my number on it, I am not going to apply. I mean, how much, how much reality is a question like, how, how do we rephrase this? How do you manage to give honest feedback in a survey? That's an issue. Um, depends on the culture of the organization. Yeah. And, you know, and we talked to the, we talked to the three clients we worked with about that and, um, you know, and make sure that so it's the framing, the frame, you've got to get the framing. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Right? And, and that's what we would do. Is it right? There would be upfront help us, communication. Help you. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did, did we get to eliminate all that? This will be the last class we ever <laughs> send you. <Yeah. laughs> well, and again, the whole purpose behind this is not designed to be punitive, correct? You know, but how in yeah. today's environment, how can that, how do you, how do you make that happen? Well, not be punitive. How not make it sense, get the sense of security, of trusting. I mean, that's an issue in corporations yeah, these yeah, days, yeah. right? I mean, yeah, yeah. Right. But yeah, okay. Our, our, I get it. our take on it is this is better than not knowing, oh, and it's better than guessing. Believe, believe me, I, I think this is incredible, but I just, <laughs> I smiled at this thing because it was so scientific up until last part, and I go like, whoa. Well, uh, we, we haven't, we're not done yet. Good, okay. Wait, I'll, we're going to come I'll, back and we're going to validate. Cool the accuracy of these of these numbers. I love it. So I, I have a question. Oh, okay. yeah, just, 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 just to address this point, and then I think your question is, uh, I'm anticipating your question. Anyhow, in terms of what Kent's talking about here, this is a level one survey. Those can be made so that they're they're confidential because it. it's not the learning survey where they know the name of the learner and what score they got on the exam for the training. This is a level one survey right. afterwards. So a level one survey, you can so just put random blind. numbers on. So this yeah. is a, a level one survey surely, you know, absolutely could be done blind. You require everyone to complete it, but you can attach random numbers to the survey. Is that what you? That did? may or may not be what you did here, <laughs> but it, but it's possible if you wanted to do that to to collect right. confidential well, data. Yeah. Then uh, then if you if that's if the but, but, yeah, but that's not useful here that, for this. That's purpose. not useful for this. Yeah. We need to know you know who they are so you can each support. person. Score. Right. We don't need to know the name, but we need to know how each person for the company knows the name. Sure. So because otherwise none of this right. stuff, otherwise it's right. random numbers. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm so, sorry for throwing the monkey. Yeah. Okay. And I, I have a question about the data actually. You did not anticipate my question. So how did you decide who falls in which category? Did you have yeah, what's your yeah. in mind? What's the classification of did I apply the, it or not? Yeah. Top fifteen percent based oh, on the Brinkerhoff Brinker research. research. Using the Brinkerhoff model. The Brinkerhoff research. And he had two research studies. The one I shared with you from two thousand four. He had another one in two thousand and eight, and he came up with in that research study fifteen percent apply. Um, Seventy percent are in the the, the at risk, the middle. The, the, we're going to go back and apply and but revert, and and fifteen percent are not going to do anything. So we have two research studies that he had done that basically came up with the same data. So what we're doing is we're just taking that those uh, those same results. We're saying okay, so the green people are the top fifteen percent, including ties. 
the yellow people are the middle 65%, including ties, and the red people are the bottom 20%. So you took the group that had the most sevens and in the survey and put them the 15% in green? Is that yeah. what I gather? Yeah, so the scores for the, the green folks over here most likely range from 7.0 down as, to 6.36. As an average score. And the, they, average became, score. they became your most likely to apply based on? Based on 74 people. We computed 15%, draw the line, if they're tied, then we include the tied. Okay? And the yellow people, the middle 65%, again, draw the line when it gets down to 509. Anybody who had 509, if there were several people, all of them were included, including tied. And they're the, they're the, the, what we call at risk, at risk of not applying. They're going to go back and try it, but it ultimately probably end up back where they were. And then these are, folks that are least likely to do anything. So I'm not really sure how to phrase this question. So if you're going to try to show, um, so if you if you adjust this program and you do this again to show that you've got better learning application uh -huh. in the future, are you going to use the same criteria to break? Because then you'll always have 15% and mm -hmm. you know 65%. No. No. So how, how, do you, how do you you'll show see. that you've gotten better? You'll see. OK. We're coming. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, we got it. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so we got, once we get through the data, it'll go a little faster. All right. So we're using the same data. All right. Same 12 survey items. And what we're going to do now is to crunch the data differently so that we can predict which of the managers of the learners are most likely to do a good job uh, and uh, which managers are likely to, most likely to do a poor job of supporting the training that they had sent their employees to attend. So the same survey data, we're just crunching the numbers differently. So MTSI scores manager training support index scores. So that's a that's what the MTSI stands for. So what we've got here is the average manager score. So the let's start over here. So these are the managers, unique, these numbers are unique managers. <clears throat> Second column, the number of direct reports that attended the training program that each manager had attend. Okay. And so the third column is we looked at the average manager score when we looked at the work environment and we saw that we had the uh, average manager score was based on the item that, that talked about how likely the manager was to engage the learner post program about you know what was learned and so on. Um, and so it's the average score from these four people uh, for how they responded on that question about their manager and whether their manager was likely to you know engage them in a discussion post program. We've now changed this. So this is what we just don't have any data because we just changed the, the, the algorithm. We now are going to have a, uh, we're going to combine the question about what happened pre, before the program, yeah. along with what happened afterwards. And so we'll take those two scores and combine them and come up with an average. So this average score here will then be a scale in the sense that we've got two different data points going into that a number. Yeah. Okay. So the third column over here, uh, I'm sorry, the fourth column uh, is the average learner application index score for these four people who report to this manager. So we went just back, we went back in and looked at the LAI scores. Okay. And we came up with an average learner application index score. You, you can look at the one way to look at these two different columns. This is potential, the potential for application. The higher the number, the greater potential of applying what was learned. And this score over here is really a, an indication of support, manager support. And are, there, is the, are they going to contribute to the likelihood of training transfer happening, or are they going to become an impediment? And so we then simply just subtract the LAI score from the average manager score. And so you can see the differences here, and they range all the way from a plus 0.84 down here, you can see the lowest score was a minus 1.61, so quite a range. And these managers up here 
are the ones who are most likely to do a decent job of supporting the training that they sent their employees to attend. So the top three managers, and actually I'm being generous here because this manager got a zero. So they're, they're not likely to be a detriment, but they're, you know, they're not a great support source either. Whereas at least these are providing some support. But you look at all the other managers, they're likely to do a poor job because their scores look indicate that they are likely to get in the way and prevent whatever uh, whatever possibility there was over here from the LAI from the from the, uh, um, the learners who attended the program uh, from applying what they applied applying what they learned back on the job. Okay. One more thing we did, we took the three components, talked about that being research-based, that there's some science behind that. So one of the other things we wanted to look at is let's look at these components and see whether there's any difference in the way they're contributing to training transfer or aren't contributing to training transfer. So what we found was uh, not only are the numbers different, so this, when we looked at the learner application index, score, those, are the, those are the four items from the uh, learner application index, right? Four items that came up with an average score. Same thing for the learning program design, same thing for the work environment. Again, that the work environment's only got three because we didn't, when we collected this data, we didn't have the one about what was gonna happen before the training. Um, and so the other thing we did is, I, I don't know how familiar you are with statistics, but we applied something called a t-test to see not only are the numbers different, but are they statistically significantly different? And so what we found was that there is a statistically significant difference between the scores on the learner application index and the scores on the learner work environment. There's also a statistically significant difference between the scores on the learning program design and the scores on the learner uh, work environment index. So it was clear that the biggest problem that they had when you looked at the three training transfer components, the biggest issue they had was around the learner work environment. That thing that they needed to focus their efforts on first, not only, but first. You know, if they were going to try to increase training transfer, they needed to do something about the learner work environment because it was a waste of sending people to training when they went back into the same environment and it was little likely that the transfer was going to occur. The other interesting thing we found with this one. What's the lowest score? Was new information was acquired? That came as a surprise to them. Mm -hmm. And so what we found, and what they found out is when we came up with the data, is they went back and they grabbed a handful of the learners and they said, hey, you know, this came out as the lowest score. Can you help us understand why that was? And as it turned out, what happened was they were putting all these people through this continuous process improvement training, and the vast majority of people in the organization had attended similar training somewhere else, either in their previous job, in school, or something. They weren't learning anything new. It was all stuff that they'd already learned. They could have saved themselves a lot of money and a lot of time by doing a job aid mm -hmm. and just ask people if they'd had this before. If they had it before, here, just look at the job aid. Yeah. Okay. So that's the, the data we're able to generate just from those 12 survey items. So we've got two predictive scores, the learners, the managers, and then we have a, a, a data point uh, in terms of the, uh, the three components. So we wait now 30 days yeah. after the training. We have all that information so we know who they are. We got it. So we're going to wait 30 days. And then what we're going to do is collect data from a random sample of the calibration cohort people. That's a group of 40 to 60, or in this case, 72. Um, and we're going to either use a survey or focus groups, and we're going to ask them three questions. First question is, uh, at the end of the 30 days, again, um, keep in mind, this is being done 30 days later after they attended the program. So we're going to ask them, what percent of the program material, and by the way, I should say also that we spent at the beginning of the focus groups, um, the, what they did is they spent a few minutes uh, reviewing all the program content. So they went through and said, because it's been 30 days, yeah, right? Yeah. So they, they had a, a, a handout that said, here's an outline of all the material we covered. And then they talked about that and reviewed it. Sure. So then they said, okay, so given all this, what percent of the program 
material, you know, have you applied back in the job? So right. you go, you can say, yeah. hey, Tim, yeah. and you're going to say, well, hundred. You shouldn't want to look bad, right? Or you can say, what program? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the second question we asked after we went around and got answers to the first thing uh -huh. was, how confident that your estimate is accurate, from uh -huh. zero to 100 percent? So what we're kind of trying to do is we're trying to control for errors in estimates. So we're trying to control for that by the way we crunch the data. And then the third question we asked is, oh. you know, Timothy, if you're not applying 100% yeah. and you're not 100% confident, then what got in the way? What kinds of things prevented you from applying what you wanted to do? And that's cool because it makes them reflect more on the whole thing. Yeah. And we get and, and plus it gets you some really interesting data. Yeah, yeah. So here's what we found with the, the medical <clears throat> insurance group. So the best case scenario here is, this is the best case scenario, 57% of that program was scrapped. 57% of that program was not being applied back on the job. That was scrapped money. That's the best case. Wow. Worst case is 74% of it is scrapped. It's not being used or applied back on the job. Yeah. That's based on the answers to the first two questions and the way we go through and crunch the data there. And then the obstacles, what we do is we just summarize all the obstacles and we do a count. <laughs> and so keep in mind what is the three components, right, in work environment, and look at the top two. Yeah. So we have data, and we also had 10 out of the 12 managers, 10 of them had, were, had negative scores or lowest scores on the MCM side. Wow. So it's pretty clear when you look at the data what they need to focus on here. Yeah. So what we now know at the end of phase one is which learners are most likely um, and at risk and least likely to apply what they've learned, which managers are likely to do a good job or a poor job of supporting the training, which of the components are contributing to training transfer and which aren't, uh, and we know the scrap learning baseline score, so we now have a way that we can measure against that, if we're asking about that, mm -hmm. that's how we're gonna, is we'll do this same exercise with other people that come through the program, and then we do the comparison with the this scrap learning calculation with the new one. That's where we get at how you're, you know, making the improvement. Yeah. And we also know the obstacles. So you've probably seen this one. So, yeah. You know, without facts, you're just another person with an opinion. And so now you got facts. You got stuff you can use to manage, uh, measure, and manage scrap learning. Okay, so let me uh, breeze through this because I know I don't have so much. Like one minute. <laughs> one minute. Okay, so now we move into phase two. So what we're now doing is uh, going to take all that data and we're going to then begin to address the obstacles, begin to address the uh, least likely and uh, at risk learners, and begin to address the, the uh, managers who are likely to do a poor job of supporting the training. And uh, so this is kind of where the rubber meets the road because we're now going to be you know, trying to change things and make some improvements. Um, so we're going to identify the solutions. And let me, we, we just talked about that. So um, let me just give you some examples. So these are just, a, this is a kind of a composite list of some things that the, the clients we've worked with have come up with to use with the uh, least likely to apply learners and the at-risk learners. So the yellow and the red people. So these were all different things. They didn't all use all of these, but these were the different kinds of things. They targeted at those people yeah. uh, to try to move them from the yellow or red into the green, and then have stuff in place that they could then use as new learners came through the program. It was there, it was ready for them, and they could just roll it out right after the program, right after the people started attending the program. And here's what they came up with for the managers. So they came up with a whole bunch of stuff that they were doing with the managers that had low or, or negative MTSI scores. Again, it's just a composite list to address the managers because they yeah, gotta, they gotta do something thing. with them, especially that medical insurance company because of their uh, the low uh, work environment score. So you, the other thing we're gonna do is we validate uh, our learner application index score. So prediction without validation is nothing more than an educated guess. Uh, or malfeasance, and so what we want to do is to correlate those um, learner application index scores with 
uh, level two and level three learning behavior results. So we're gonna administer a level two knowledge test, capture some level three evaluation data, and then correlate the LAI scores with that. And basically this is all about correlation, so we won't go through that. Uh, what we found was with one client that we, that's gotten this far, is we ended up with on the level three, mm -hmm. we ended up with a correlation about uh, of like uh, 0.45. So moderately strong positive correlation, which said, that those learner application index scores weren't 100% accurate, but they weren't bad, right? They weren't bad. Now, if we had 1.00, then they'd be 100% accurate. So uh, now we're going to recalculate scrap learning. So we're going to get a new wave of learners, right? And then we'll just ask them the same three questions. And so then we'll be able to compare what scrap learning was with the initial calibration cohort group with new people sure. now that are going through the program after we've addressed all these things that we've identified with our data. Okay. And then just reporting your results out. So quick summary issue of scrap learning, they've been around forever, but what's different today is that you have a way to measure and manage it. I do have an ebook that I've created that overviews all this. If you're interested in that, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me know. Well done. Yeah. And I will be happy to send it to you. Actually, it's under revision, so you I able I mean, I'll send you the wait, wait, I'll wait and send you the new one because it's, it's currently being done, yeah. but we're almost done with it. I also have a whole bunch of articles that I've written, short, um, and you probably won't need too much coffee to get through some of these. <laughs> but if you want more information about it, I'll send you the ebook, send you the articles, and, and uh, that'll give you a lot more information. So, Ken, the secret sauce in this thing gets back to the management and what they're doing. So, what was the reaction of leadership and management when you come back and say, Huh, we can fix this, but guess what? It's less about the design and it's more about you. Were they happy, sad, in denial? What did they do? Oh, man, that's a good question. The, um, this medical insurance company, uh, they, um, one of the things I didn't show in here, but we can also do is we can take uh, and convert scrap learning to wasted dollars and wasted time yeah, for yeah. that program. Yeah. They said, we don't want to do that because <laughs> yeah, we think that's all the career suicide. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, but they did share the data and they, and then, so, and apparently there was some, there was recognition in the company that, you know, the things weren't going as they should. Yeah. And so they got some support for moving forward and trying to change that. And they're now changing the culture. Change. Yeah, they're implementing yeah, yeah. a program for all the managers, part of which is dealing with what to do when you send somebody to training. Yeah. So, um, we're a little bit over time, so I'd like to wrap up. Um, thank you, Ken. Please give him a round of applause. Yeah. 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 And, Ken, uh, we know you've spent quite a bit of time preparing and uh, sharing with us, so we have a talk about our appreciation. So oh, thanks thank so much. You. This has been enlightening. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. well done. Okay. Thank you. Um, and, and as we wrap up, just a little bit of announcement. Our uh, CDM takes the rest of the summer off. We come back um, in September. Just so you, you know, we typically meet on the second Friday of every month, every other month. Sorry. Our next topic is going to be um, Al Harris and Andy Kramer on uh, unconscious gender bias in the workplace. So I think it'll be a real interesting topic. We are not affiliated with the OD Network or ATD, but uh, we do collaborate with them. So there's some things coming up at the ATD. They've got an August 2nd um, mega networking event. So if you want to find out about that, just Google ATD Chicago. Uh, we also uh, have a, a colleague down in uh, the city that meets at Northern Trust. They are the Chicago OD Practitioners Network. They continue through the summer. They usually meet on the last Friday of every month, and they're coming up with coincidentally breaking through gender bias and building a respectful culture. So you can get a preview of that. And then finally, the OD Network Chicago meets downtown. Also, their next meeting is June 14th, the ultimate culture and performance learning experience, and July 18th, summer picnic and annual meeting. So again, if you Google any of those, or if you want to know more, I've got them right here on my computer. Um, once again, this session not only is great because of our our presenter, but because of all the interaction both online and in the room. So, so thank you so much for coming and thank you so much for diving in. Great discussion and great questions. We'll hope to see you all in September. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. So, we'll sign off here, but people are welcome to stay in the room and chat and corner Ken and ask more, more 40 questions. Bye, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>